Um, our organization, IRI, is committed to inclusively strengthening democratic institutions uh, to ensure meaningful and safeguard and sustainable safeguards against violence and extremism. By equipping NGO actors to peacefully and effectively advocate for change in their communities and reinforcing the importance of inclusive policy development among government officials, you know, it's important to lead cutting edge programming to promote peaceful democratic change in some of the most conflict prone areas of the world, such as East Africa, South Asia, and North Africa. The religious community is a critical component of this work in addressing violent conflict and preventing radicalization across the world. Approaches to countering violent extremism, conflict mitigation, and stabilization work more broadly must include the lens of improved local governance and providing political solutions to protracted conflicts and shocks to the stabilizing process. This necessitates the inclusion of formal and informal leaders as well as marginalized populations. Uh, both of which include religious leaders. Religion is often targeted or exploited by violent groups. In order to protect the free, safe expression of religion around the world, government officials must develop and promote inclusive policies, and community leaders must hold their officials accountable to ensure political systems remain unbiased and uncorrupt. Societies must institutionalize open, transparent principles in order for citizens around the world to more freely and safely practice their religions. As democracy flourishes, so too does the free, peaceful expression of religion. We will be investigating these issues today in two panels. The first will explore religion and countering violent extremism, and the second on interfaith peace, peace building's role in, in advancing religious freedom. Between the two panels, we will have a break uh, for a brief reception in the Leland Atrium just outside this room. For those of, of, so both of you who need to pray during this break, uh, space will be provided uh, and available. Before our first panel, um, I am very pleased to introduce our first speaker, former Congressman Frank Wolf. In over his 30 years in Congress, Representative Wolf was a strong advocate for human rights generally and religious freedom specifically. It was his tireless efforts that contributed to the passage of the International Religious Freedom Act in 1998. And it's a testament to his long commitment that the 2016 act that strengthened IRFA bears his name. We are so pleased that he can join us today to kick off the discussion. Uh, Congressman Wolf, uh, I'd like to invite you to give your remarks and thank you for your service. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I would say I, I was here at the dedication of the U.S. Institute for Peace building. And having an event like this, I think, is what Senator Ted Stevens would want. And also, I would say uh, what Mark Hatfield would want. And so I commend the U.S. Institute for Peace. I think this is kind of an opportunity for you as you begin to uh, develop programs with regard to this. President Reagan. I said that the words in the Constitution and the words in the Declaration of Independence were a covenant, a covenant not only with the people in Philadelphia in 1776, my hometown, or a covenant with the people in Philadelphia in 1787, but a covenant with the entire world, a covenant with a Nigerian up in Jos who's been threatened by Boko Haram and the Fulani militants, a covenant with the people of, of, uh, of Pakistan, Asia Bibi, who, who is in prison, a covenant with uh, uh, the Rohingya in Burma, who I believe are now facing a genocide, a covenant with a Catholic nun in, in Iraq, a sister Diana, who went through terrible times, a covenant with the Yazidi up on Mount Sinjar, who can't understand now why the world isn't focusing. So I think what you're doing here is kind of fitting in and to carry through that covenant. During the days as I came in, I saw George Shultz's name there. Uh, you want to get to the point where during George Shultz and Jim Baker, that whenever they would go to any embassy, whether it be in Moscow or Bucharest or wherever, they would meet with the dissidents. They would meet with those who were being persecuted, whether human rights, religious rights, and they would be identify and advocate for. So I think there's a unique opportunity, and I heard this continues as you, you, you move on. When you look at the Pew survey, and it's so painful, 
every year it goes up and up and up. Now it's over 80%. You don't want to exaggerate, but Pew survey over 80% with regard to people living in a religiously re repressive environment, over 5.5 billion, billion people. You have to say at times, and I say it very delicately, there has been a somewhat inherent bias uh, by the State Department, really, I've seen since 1993, 94, beyond. The bill that I introduced that created the law was opposed by the State Department. John Shattuck came up and testified against the bill, and you've almost had a, re a bias, if you will, some legitimate insofar as the Establishment Clause. I think we all are concerned, particularly in our country, of the Establishment Clause, but not to be involved in the issue of working with faith groups and religious groups. You have to understand that, that is part of the problem with regard to the Rohingya. That's why the Chinese government are doing what they're doing to the, to the Uyghurs. At uh, one of the receptions uh, the other night, two young uh, Uyghur uh, 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 men came, came, came up to me. Uh, they said, one said, I have 87, uh, 87 relatives that are in a detention camp in China. Another one said, I have two relatives who have been killed by the Chinese government for basically being Uyghurs. Counter and violence extremism, I mean, for these young people, that is the way. And so the very fact that this group and others in our State Department is engaged is to be very, very helpful. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights makes it, makes it clear that this is an important issue. I won't read it, but you also know it. There are opportunities uh, to really make a difference. People of faith uh, do what they do because of their faith. Mother Teresa went into India and Calcutta and did what she did because of her faith. Chuck Colson in my country, in, in America, led the effort, all this effort we now hear about prison reform really came out of what Chuck Colson's work did and the Colson Commission with regard to reforming the prison. Chuck did it because of his faith. And Dr. Brantley, who was with Samaritan's Purse, got Ebola himself fighting Ebola in Africa. So people do things of all different religious denominations because of their, their faith. In closing, I think he had a couple oppor opportunities moving forward. One, I believe you, had, you have a great team in the Trump-Pence administration. I think with Secretary Pompeo, I served with him in the House, as good as you're going to get on this issue. Ambassador Brownback, uh, he's as good as you're ever going to, going to get. He's like an Esther for such a time like this. I think David Saperstein did a great job, and I think Ambassador Brownback will do a good job. I travel with Ambassador Brownback. We are the first two guys to go to Darfur when the genocide was taking place. I watched him in action. We were in a little village that John Jaweed were surrounded it, and two young uh, Muslim girls had been assaulted. And I saw, I watched Ambassador Brownback in action. You could not have a better person working on this issue. And one of the first trips he took was to, uh, to, to Burma with regard to, to the Rohingya. Also with regard to uh, Administrator Green. Mark Green is as good as you're going to get uh, to be running AID, to be dealing with programs that help. So I think the team that is in place uh, is, is, is an outstanding team. And I have always believed that personnel is policy. And if you put the right personnel in, they will develop the right policy. Whereas if you have a great policy and poor personnel, it doesn't happen. The last, the, the last issue is this is unique in another respect. Uh, I'm a good friend of uh, my best friend in Congress is Congressman Tony Hall, a liberal Democrat, supported President Obama. We came together and worked together and still work together on all, all these issues. Nancy Pelosi is a good friend of mine. We had an event two weeks ago where we had a prisoners of conscience event where we brought different congressional offices and groups to adopt prisoners of conscience in China. Whether it, whether it be the Uyghurs, whether it be the Buddhist Tibetan. The Pancha Lama has been taken away at age six and never been seen since. This was saying, let's, let's adopt, let's do things. We had Leader Pelosi come, who was eloquent, and then we had Senator Cruz come. So here we had the former Democratic Speaker of the House come, and there would not be a Tom Blantos commission had it not been for, for Ms. Pelosi. And then we had Ted Cruz, 
who was one of the, running for president with regard to, to the Republican Party. You have Jim, Jim McGovern, who is as good as you're ever going to get from Massachusetts with Randy Hochgren. The point I'm trying to say is there is, particularly for those of you from our country, we know we're going through a tough time, polar polarization. On this issue, there is not the polarization. It used to be in the old days, it would be from Blantos to Chris Smith to Henry Hyde. There is a bipartisan majority and there's a consensus to deal with this issue. And so I think this is a unique, a unique opportunity. One, we have administration that cares. We have a team in there that I think is as good as you're ever going to, going to get. I say that as a, as a conservative Republican, but I think they're good. But we also have a bipartisan issue. We have Leader Pelosi and we have a, we, we have a, a Senator Cruz. We have, we, have a, we have a Chris Smith and we have a Jim McGovern. This is the opportunity to really make a difference for people of faith, to advocate for the Rohingya in Burma. I mean, personally, I believe sanctions ought to be put on the Burmese. When I read the story and then talk to Reba Kadir, who some of you may know, Reba came by to see me about two months ago. 30 of her grandchildren have been taken away to a detention camp. I mean, it's almost like Stalinist. It's like, it's like Mao. And so we can come together and we can advocate. And I think what this moment is, and I thank Nancy and the U.S. Institute for Peace for having it. This is a, a, an important moment where we can make a tremendous difference to help people of faith, of all faiths around the world. Thank you very much. I could ask our first panel to please join me on the stage. Shake them by. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Congressman Hall. That was, uh, sorry, thank you, Congressman Wolf. You put Tony Hall in my brain. Um, thank you very much that, for, the, for the inspirational opening um, and putting us exactly uh, in the right frame of mind. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you, Tony uh, and Mike, for the partnership with uh, IRI and Search for Common Ground. There you are. Um, it's really wonderful to be able to do this event together. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president here at U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody. Let me uh, repeat what Tony said, that uh, please join us on the Twitter conversation at um, hashtag IRF ministerial, and a special welcome to all of you who have uh, been at the ministerial this week. It truly is, uh, has been an important gathering um, that's brought people together from across the world. For those of you who have not been at USIP before, uh, we were founded in 1984 by Congress through the conviction of uh, congressional members like uh, Congressman Wolf. Um, and we were uh, founded as a uh, nonpartisan, independent, national institution dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible that it is very practical and it requires the kind of focused effort uh, that we do by working with partners in conflict zones around the world, uh, helping them have access to the tools, the information, and the approaches that enable them to manage conflict so it doesn't become violent and to resolve it when it does. And we know from long conviction and experience that freedom of religion is an absolute vital component for a lasting, sustained peace. Um, and in fact, in our, uh, some 20 years ago, uh, we started what is now one of our longest programs, which is Peace and Religion. And a former colleague, David Little, 
was uh, involved with the drafting and the advising of the International um, Religious Freedom Act. So we're delighted uh, to be able to be here today. This is an issue that's near and dear to our heart. Um, we also know by conviction and experience that um, it is critical to understand the relationship between religious freedom and efforts to counter violent extremism. Uh, violent extremism has been one of the critical uh, disruptors of peace uh, around the world, a threat uh, to people of many countries, including our own. And what we found, however, is that it is a complicated relationship that we need to understand so that in an effort to counter violent extremism, there isn't also an unintended suppression of religious freedom. And even in some cases, the potential to create additional resentment against the state and drive people inadvertently to more radical theologies. So these relationships need further investigation. They're, they happen differently in different places. Um, I was very encouraged to see in the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom Potomac Plan of Action that it addressed this issue head on uh, by encouraging nations to increase the international understanding of how suppression of religious freedom can contribute to violent extremism, sectarianism, conflict, insecurity, and stability. So it's clearly an issue that is on the table for conversation. And it is what we will explore in depth today. And we have a really incredible, wonderful panel, and I'm very honored to be on stage. Um, we have Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, who is really a foremost scholar on Islamic thought. Uh, we have had him here with us to discuss this topic previously. Uh, Sheikh bin Baya, welcome back to U.S. Institute of Peace. We're also joined by Reverend Professor Fadi Dao, who's chair and CEO of the Adyan Foundation in Beirut. He's an expert on inter-religious dialogue and the geopolitics of religion. Um, we have Humara Khan, who's the founder and director of Muflahun, which is a leading organization on preventing violent extremism. And welcome to Oliver Cox, uh, a longtime friend and colleague. Uh, he's the, uh, the deputy director of countering violent extremism at the US Department of State. So thank you each of you for joining us today for this very timely conversation. We will talk, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, um, and then we will take questions uh, that we're collecting on note cards. Um, so let me start uh, sh with uh, Sheikh Ben Baya and uh, Reverend Dow as religious actors, uh, Humara as your civil society expert hat, and Oliver with your government hat. Where do you see, just as a general opening question, where do you see the greatest opportunities and challenges uh, that you encounter when it comes to engaging religious actors, uh, religious institutions on the issues of countering violent extremism. And Sheikh bin Bai, are we able, can we start with you? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على اشكر المعهد اشكر معهد السلام على هذه الفرصة التي أتاحها لنا مرة أخرى فهذه المرة الثانية التي أدعى فيها المعهد لأتكلم عن السلام وعن الحرية الموضوع كما أشارت كما تكلم السناتور قبلها 
هو موضوع معقد وليس سهلا موضوع الحرية الدينية والحرية بصفة عامة هو موضوع معقد ولأجل هذا يحتاج إلى كثير من المقدمات تتعلق بشؤون من المفاهيم so um, the Sheikh said, first of all, just um, Bismillah in the name of God, and then uh, extend my gratitude to the uh, Institute for Peace here. This is the second time that I've come here to speak uh, in this forum. Um, he said that the, just as Congressman Wolf said earlier, the, the problem of uh, freedom is a, is a very complex one. It's not easily... Uh, there are a lot of dimensions to it, so it's not something that can be just easily understood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So is, is the question then, what is the role of religion in terms of dealing with these uh, challenges um, like violent extremism and freedom of religion? Is that, is that the question you're asking me? Or is it the role of religious freedom in societies? So uh, uh, the question is, uh, where has he seen either problems or opportunities when the religious actors are engaged in countering violent extremism? هو مشكلة الترجمة هي أن الإنسان ليس مرتاحا من فهم الموضوع. There's always a problem with translations because yeah, you never know if they're getting it right. So. التحديات كثيرة. There's a lot of challenges that we're facing. يواجهها. الذين يقومون على الشأن الديني وبالتالي الذين يحاولون إيجاد حرية للدين وفي نفس الوقت المحافظة على السلم الاجتماعي. So you're dealing with the challenge of spreading religious peace, but you're also dealing with the challenge of maintaining a type of social stability uh, in the midst of that. So the, these are these are two challenges. Uh, كثير من الحروب نشأت بسبب موقف مجموعات من الناس من الحرية الدينية وعدم السماح بالحرية الدينية للأقليات التي قد تكون لها دين يختلف عن دين الأغلبية. So a lot of the wars that we've had actually were the result of people uh, demanding religious freedom and also the result of minorities that have been oppressed and not allowed to uh, practice their religious freedom. Like was mentioned earlier, the problem with the Rohingyas or the problem of the Uyghurs in China. تجسدت في في إعلان مراكش لحقوق الأقليات غير المسلمة في ديار المسلمين. So perhaps you've heard of this initiative that was started by several scholars that were involved in actually developing a policy. This was the Marrakesh Declaration, which was designed to promote a religious pluralism. Uh, in, in the region where there was a lot of minorities that were being persecuted. 
اتفقت مجموعة كبيرة من علماء المسلمين وبحضور عدد أيضا معتبر من غير المسلمين على أهمية الحرية الدينية وممارسة الحرية الدينية اعتقادا وممارسة للأقليات الموجودة في ديار الأغلبيات المسلمة so this group gathered a significant number of scholars from within the Muslim religion, but also a very significant number of people from outside of the religion, Yazidis and others that were representative of the people that were being persecuted as well as the others. And, and they met and, and we agreed upon this uh, promotion of religious freedom in the majority Muslim uh, countries, especially those areas uh, that were, uh, the, the religious freedom was being infringed upon. حاولنا من خلال هذه المبادرة أن نعالج القضية جذريا من الناحية اللاهوتية. So we, we attempted to address this issue from a theological perspective. أي أن نقطع حبل المتطرفين الذي يتمسكون به والذين يحاولون أن يحملوا الدين الإسلامي بأنه ضد الأقليات غير المسلمة في ديار المسلمين. So we are, uh, what we were attempting to do was literally sever this rope that these extremists were uh, holding on to. This idea that is the Islamic religion is antagonistic to uh, religious pluralism and to minorities. وبالتالي أحيينا صحيفة المدينة وهي صحيفة كان. النبي الخاتم صلى الله عليه وسلم قد كتبها في لما قدم إلى المدينة حين هذه الصحيفة والتي تمثل مجتمعا تمثل مجتمع المواطنة المتساوية التعاقدية. So we revived uh, what was actually from the, the very foundation of Islam, which was the covenant of Medina. We revived this idea in which the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, he established a covenant of equal citizenship amongst the different uh, actors in that uh, early period. So there were different communities, and, and he gave each one of them the rights and responsibilities that were equal, whether they were Muslim or from the other communities, the Jewish community and others. ولهذا فالتحدي الأول هو كيف نثبت المواطنة كيف نثبت حقوق المواطنة. So one of the things that we also were addressing was citizenship and how do we establish the grounds for citizenship. أرجو أن يوزع إعلان مراكش لمن لم يعرف إعلان مراكش. So I hope that uh, it'll be distributed amongst you copies of it so you can understand what we. بعضكم كان هناك معنا نانسي أعتقد ال. We had Susan Hayward was with us from, from the, uh, the Institute of Peace in Marrakesh when we actually made the declaration. Pastor Bob Roberts also who's here with us from the evangelical community was with us. So this challenge that we face from within the religion itself uh, of, of this extremism, what we were attempting to do was sever uh, that, uh, that influence uh, that they have on people. So looking at what is the normative understanding of the religion. Is the religion open or is it closed? These have to be established. إذا تشاوزنا هذا التحدي فالتحدي الثاني يتعلق بالقيادات الدينية. So the second major challenge is the religious leadership itself. كيف يمكن القيادات الدينية أن توصل رسالة راشدة حكيمة إلى المجتمع إلى العموم الناس؟ How does the religious leadership deliver a, a sound, intelligent, guided, and wise message to the, the, popu the general populace? 
especially in light of the, this narrative that the extremists are presenting that is unfortunately has a type of appeal to young people in these conditions. So, so, so how do we address that and, 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 and uh, present a, a narrative that is actually more aligned with the uh, sound understanding of the religion? إذن بالنسبة لقضية الأقليات أعتقد أننا قطعنا شوطا كبيرا في معالجة هذا الموضوع. So I feel, you know, in relation to minorities in the Muslim majority countries, we actually uh, gained quite a bit of ground that we we. كيف نوصله إلى الناس؟ هذا إشكال. So one of the problems, though, is how do we disseminate this understanding and how do we inculcate a higher understanding amongst the masses of people? كيف أيضا نساعد الديانات الأخرى أن تساعدنا أيضا على أن نكون جبهة واحدة ضد أي تطرف من أي دين كان. And and so also another thing is how do we unite with the other religions in addressing this issue as a united front because each of us have within our constituencies extreme elements. So how do we come together in solidarity? ذلك ما نحاول في حلف الهضول من خلال المجموعة الإبراهيمية أو العائلة الإبراهيمية أن نتعاون في هذا المجال. And so one of the ways that we tried to address that was what we call an, the alliance of virtue, where we brought together uh, different people, especially from the Abrahamic tent, to to uh, come together in solidarity with these agreed upon uh, values and virtues that we share as as a community. إذا الحرية المسؤولة الحرية التي تخدم السلم الاجتماعي الحرية التي تراعي كل وضع في كل بلد نحن إطفائيون صحيح نحن نؤيد الحرية لكننا في نفس الوقت نحن إطفائيون نبحث عن إطفاء الحرب في أي مكان لا نريد أن تطلق الشرارة ليحترق الناس يريد حرية متوازنة في نفس الوقت مسؤولة وباحثة عن السلم الاجتماعي وأيضا محترمة لما يسمى بالنظام العام. So we we're definitely in support of religious freedom and freedom in general, but we also have to understand our role right now is just putting out fires. We're dealing with fires of war in the region. We want a balanced freedom. We want a freedom that has its rights, but also has its recognized responsibilities, especially in regards to what we would call the social order. I think by now you want me to just uh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sheikh Bin Baya, and thank you for your work on the Marrakesh Declaration and the Alliance of Virtue. These are both, and I commend people to look into those. Um, I want to go to Reverend Dow. Um, as, uh, in your experience as a Christian minister in the Middle East, um, what would your advice be to policymakers and practitioners of how should they support religious actors, especially from different faiths, to work on this issue of countering violent extremism? What, what's your experience and what would your good counsel be? Thank you. Uh, let me first of all say that how much I'm, I'm glad to be here and uh, uh, at the Institute of Peace. This is my first visit to the Institute. I'm really uh, happy for this and uh, also I'm honored to be a part of this panel and uh, near Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, who is, I would like to recognize that the work he's doing is uh, really moving the situation uh, for uh, more sustainable, I would say, peace. Maybe the fruits are not directly visible today, but I'm sure that what he is doing and the whole uh, team working with him is building the future and, and, uh, and uh, peace for the, in the future. So thank you. Um, answering your question, I mean, it's a very, very complex question. I would like very very briefly to, to say that uh, um, the relation between policymakers and religious leaders is always complex. And uh, uh, viewed from the Middle Eastern perspective, sometimes it can be even uh, not only complex but problematic. Because sometimes it can, uh, it can um, reflect kind of um, 
manipulation or, 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 or kind of uh, uh, looking from a policy maker, maker's perspective for kind of legitimacy uh, uh, that were, will make uh, religion less credible in its, in its uh, message uh, on the social level. Uh, to, uh, to take the, the other side of the story and the more positive, I would say, side of the story, um, we are witnessing uh, nowadays, and especially in the Middle East and in the Christian-Muslim relations also, um, a, a, a huge step uh, forward uh, when it comes to coexistence and living together and building peace in societies and facing extremism also. I would call this in, in, in uh, at the Ann Foundation, I mean the organization that I chair, uh, we, we created this concept of inclusive citizenship, which reflects in fact what Marak's declaration is saying about the fact that uh, it's not, when I say inclusive citizenship, it's not just saying that we are all equal citizens together, but we are all uh, part of one community uh, including the whole diversity coming from different cultural, religious backgrounds composing uh, this, uh, this unique community. So, what I want to point here is that recently, for example, after Marrakesh Declaration 2016, we had in 2017 a conference um, organized by Al-Azhar, where the concept also was supported, um, a, um, calling for the adoption, the full adoption of citizenship and inclusive citizenship in, in, in the societies. Uh, Muslim-majority society or non necessary, not necessarily Muslim-majority societies. I mean, in, in general, I would say that this concept applies also to any society today. Um, so the relation between policymakers and the religious leaders on this level is um, how they can collaborate by ensuring that inclusive citizenship has, at the same time, time its um, religious legitimacy, let's say, and so developing a religious discourse that gives uh, its legitimacy, but at the same time, the legal and political framework to be really implemented uh, with, within uh, societies. Uh, this, I would say, the key point today in the collaboration, possible collaboration between policy makers and religious leaders. Of course, there are so many other points, but I want to be brief for this first answer. Great, thank you. Um, and so I, I want to go to a similar question to Humara. Um, where in this relationship between countering violent relationship and religion do you see uh, y you know, the most effective ways of addressing uh, the, the, the challenges? Okay. I will. I'll start out by saying thank you actually to U.S. Institute of Peace, um, our host, the International Republican Institute, as well as Search for Common Ground for having us. It's really an honor to be on this panel with, um, with my fellow panelists, and thank you, Nancy, as well. Uh, so in terms of how do we work around this challenge space, right? And really, part of it is how do we even bring some of these stakeholders to the table to recognize that they're all stakeholders, right? Uh, in, in the space I work in, both as a CSO, but then also working or engaging with policy level um, from the UN Security Council, different governments, law enforcement, etc. Um, one of the things we find is that there is a there is a general lack of understanding or misconception about the role of religion in actually causing violent extremism. So the starting point for many is that religion is the first factor, and it's the cause of. Uh, violent extremism in the first place. And yet, if you look at the research which is coming from the ground, right, in terms of what is actually happening with people, and this is across the spectrum of extremisms. So if you look at fascism, you look at the Al-Qaeda, ISIS, you look at the neo-Nazi movements across the board, what we are seeing is that the factors which are creating vulnerability, the sense of who am I, identity, belonging, purpose, sense of like helplessness and lack of control, Right, feelings of social discrimination, marginalization, relative deprivation, you know, all of those aspects, those are the, the grievances that are starting the quest for something. And then when someone is looking, right, they're struggling with life, and then they start looking, the question is, what will pull them in? In some cases, we see gangs, some, in some cases, it's, it's it's uh, drugs, you name it, social evils. But now we have violent extremist groups as part of our menu options. Which means that when you're trying to do prevention, right, religion ends up being a protective factor because it can actually increase the, the barriers to entry against violence. Right? And so we have to understand the role of it first, and that's usually not the starting point. Right? And when the first response of many governments has actually been, well, 
either we should have no religion, religion is, should be excluded from the, the, the space entirely, or if they're including religion, the assumption is there is only one form of religion and they should be the one controlling it. So top-down control from governments on what is an acceptable form of religion, actually it's restricting the religious freedom space. And so even having everyone come to the table and have a common understanding of the dynamics which are actually playing out on the ground, working with the communities and understanding what is actually happening on the ground, that's the first step. And that's, once we can overcome that, it really helps because then you can move past a lot of the suspicions and the distrust in terms of should you want to be at the table and actually making the table bigger. And once, and reality is, if you're trying to prevent or counter violent extremism, we need alliances. These are going to be partnerships which are going to include governments, they're going to include the full spectrum of civil society, private sector, and religion, right? Necessarily. Religion, religious, the whole space of religion, right? This, religion is the moral compass for society. Right? Those, those values are essential, and if we are going to try and create these resilient communities and societies, we need that space, and we need to have that space where people can be, belong to any faith or no faith and be an equal citizen. Right? I am not less of a citizen because of my faith. Right? And so I think part of it is, is reframing some of how we understand this faith, so we're not pitting um, religion and religious freedom against security. So, so Oliver, I saw you nodding your head, um, but I want to ask you, you know, Humar is talking about the assumption that religion is part of the problem um, without going deeper into the particular drivers. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on engaging religious actors to create counter narratives to be to provide a different vision for what the opportunities are. Where have you, where have you seen that work well? Where do, what do you see as the pitfalls? I mean, I know that it's been an approach, certainly that, that many governments have used. Um, what's been your experience with that? Well, thanks, uh, Nancy, and thanks to the Institute for organizing this uh, session and including me. Um, I think that uh, the counter narratives work it for Countering violent extremism in general uh, is very important. It's one of a number of uh, lines of effort that we have in countering violent extremism or countering terrorist radicalization and recruitment. Equally important is uh, working in and with communities face to face. Uh, because there uh, is a lot of research to show that radicalization and recruitment uh, still require that personal and still often face-to-face -face element and relationship um, to bring somebody who may be vulnerable uh, to become a, a sympathizer or a supporter. So that obviously can happen online, but in many places it still happens face-to-face -face as well. So uh, the different areas of countering violent extremism are linked uh, and should be increasingly linked, but um, I would like to uh, disagree a little bit with Himera on one point. I think there is a uh, growing understanding and appreciation of the range of factors that can drive radicalization and recruitment. Uh, I think w we all agree that ideas matter, ideology matters uh, in this case, uh, but there are other social, psychological, uh, political, economic, and, and other factors that are work uh, at work. And as we know, uh, we have to look at the local context to see which drivers may be the most salient. Um, it makes our collective work even more difficult when uh, analysts and researchers who know this subject well tell us that even in the same community, uh, what may drive one individual to become uh, radicalized or recruited may differ somewhat from uh, another individual. So we have to look at um, not just the community level, but uh, 
the, the individual levels as well. I'd like to just touch on a couple of other what I think are opportunities and challenges here um, from what we've seen uh, around the world. Uh, Zumeira mentioned, obviously, religious leaders are one partner. Uh, CVE, to be effective, has to be a whole of community, whole of society, whole of government approach. And r religious leaders, like other actors, bring something to the table. And so increasingly, the future of what is effective is, uh, as I think you put it, Umera, what, who's in the alliance? Who's sitting around the table? What are they bringing to the table? How are they pooling their efforts uh, and, and doing this as a multi-sectoral uh, approach? The problem is multidimensional. Therefore, the response um, has to be multidimensional as well. Um, so I think that's actually an opportunity as well as uh, a challenge. Uh, obviously, doing this kind of work, there are um, sensitivities regarding um, the security of those that are engaged in doing it at the local level. Uh, it can be their physical security, their political security, uh, reputational uh, risks, but uh, the people doing this work on the ground um, often recognize that. and. Uh, we, we, of course, have to be um, sensitive uh, to that. I think one of the big challenges here is uh, the appeal to youth, and the Sheikh mentioned uh, the appeal to youth, and this is where the research is so important, because as adults uh, over, pick your age, 35 or 40, um, we are increasingly removed from what appeals to a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old, uh, and, and this tends to be the age span where, uh, where vulnerability uh, grows and where we still have an opportunity to intervene. So understanding not only what drives radicalization, but also what appeals to youth, uh, I think is a challenge, not just for religious leaders, but for, for all of us. Great, thank you, Oliver. And um, Humaira, I wanna go back to you because both you and Oliver alluded to this core tension between the security concerns and the, the freedom to practice your religion. So how does civil society engage in addressing the challenge of, of, of violent extremism and the security threat that it represents while also keeping an eye on preserving the core freedom to practice one's religion? How do you think about that? How, do, how have you seen that balance work or how have you navigated that challenge? Uh, it's very hard to find the balance. And in most, uh, in most contexts where it's playing out, it's not a happy balance at all. And it's certainly dynamic. Um, the, and part of this is, is perhaps the way the, the space of countering violent extremism even evolved. And because it started off as an offshoot of counterterrorism, the responses or the, the tactics and tools which were used tended to be very um, military and law enforcement heavy. And it has been a fight again to even get, open the space up and actually move some of those tactics away. The security challenge is always there, um, but I think part of that is that um, CVE, right, or actually religious freedom, I'm gonna talk about religious freedoms, uh, especially that, um, is that we, we need to be upholding human rights, right? And that has to be done whether we're talking about just the security side, whether we're talking about countering violent extremism, whether we're talking about any aspect of this space. And we have to make sure that those are upheld. So if we are actually doing security well, we would actually be upholding the whole spectrum of human rights, and CVE programming would actually also be compliant. Now, that doesn't take away the risk to actually the stakeholders or the implementers on the ground, because at the end of the day, you're dealing with people who hate you for what, you, what you're doing, right? They have a vested interest, a like, these are polit this political violence, right? So there's a vested interest in terms of the outcomes. Um, so we absolutely have to deal with, with that space. Right? How do you keep people on the, safe on the ground? The other challenge that we face is when civil society starts to engage in this space, um, it ends up 
uh, often being co-opted or contaminated by the idea that you are now a, a stooge for the government. Okay? And so the assumption then becomes that if you're actually trying to work in your own community just for safety, security, you are somehow doing something against the government. And so the, again, and it just goes back to there's a lot of assumptions that uh, CVE is necessarily, cannot possibly uh, uphold human rights. And it's rights of not just religious freedom, but also on privacy and um, freedom of thought, a whole spectrum of issues. Um, so we grapple with it all the time. We have seen there are certain places where the way they have dealt with it is by changing the labels, right? So instead of acknowledging the intent of the program, they have relabeled it as something else. But that sort of deception for the community always comes back and bites you later. We have seen the, the uh, co-opting of other agendas. So things like women's empowerment, women's education, um, voting rights, etc., have suddenly been relabeled as CVE, and that has also contaminated agendas, because those are things which you have to do no matter what, whether you were dealing with violent extremism or not. So again, the, this, this space which has spread out to be everything, right, has actually made the situation worse, and then dealing with the top-down, very coercive, controlling um, counter-terrorism tactics, which in many cases have actually backfired, and have actually been the cause of more grievances has actually made it worse. So it's a, there's no balance. <laughs> there's no balance which anyone has achieved and everyone is constantly struggling in that space. So I wanna go back to Oliver really quickly because your office has worked with ministries of religion around the world. Um, have you seen examples of where that challenge has been navigated well or not well uh, of you know address, doing doing what we see in the new uh, Pot Potomac plan of action of ensuring that false accusations of extremism are not used as a pretext to suppress the freedom of individuals to express their religious beliefs. Well, I think uh, some in the room may be familiar with CVE national action plans, or sometimes they're called national strategies, and. Uh, they're being developed and uh, increasingly being implemented in dozens of countries around the world, uh, from Western Europe to Sub-Saharan Africa to different parts of Asia. And the idea here is that uh, you have security and non-security uh, components of government, uh, and that would include uh, in countries where you have a ministry or religious affairs department, uh, that they would be part of the effort and to the extent that those processes can be um, really whole of government and really engaging with uh, society and with civil society actors and then can be implemented uh, moving forward, uh, you have a framework and you have a, a political commitment and buy-in uh, from, from the top to uh, do this work and to do it in ways that try to navigate these these various sensitivities uh, that uh, that we've been talking about and that we've been touching on. Uh, that is is a framework, and the different UN agencies and uh, a number of Western governments are supporting or providing the technical assistance to you know develop, uh, or I should say, to assist other governments in developing and implementing uh, these plans. But the, the, the trick, of course, is, is in the implementation. And so with that, I want to go back to Sheikh bin Baya, who's both, you are both a renowned uh, Islamic scholar, but you're also a former government official in Mauritania. And so I would love to hear your perspective on um, how you think policymakers and practitioners from the US who are concerned about both religious freedom and countering violent extremism can best work with governments from Muslim majority countries, given these tensions. Uh, 
القضية معقدة والذي أنصح به أن تدرس حالة كل كل حالة أن تدرس حالة كل بلد ما فيها أحد يترجم القوم يا حمزة شيخ خلينا نشوف So the translation is working on channel 6, right? Channel 1, channel 1. Okay. The translation is working on the channel 6, right? Channel 1, channel 1. Ah. Sheikh Hamza is working on the channel 6, right? As I said, the issue is complicated. And in other words, the one I would like to do is to study every situation على حدة بمعنى إذا أريد التدخل في منطقة أو في دولة معينة يجب أن تدرس الحالة في هذا البلد لأن قضية الحريات الدينية في بلد ما تختلف عنها في بلد آخر ف... the, the, the nature of it actually differs in different places If there's a lot of very strong intervention, there'll actually be a reaction that could be very negative, and then the actual results could be even worse. So the, this freedom that we want and that we're all seeking in, in certain situations could end up creating, if, if there's an attempt to force it upon people, it'll, it'll upset uh, the, the, uh, the social order and so but and and also we can't generalize this principle in every situation the 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 united states needs to understand that the world is different and there's there's certain things that are relative to different countries that um there are absolutes but there are also situations that are uh, nuanced socially uh, for instance you have uh, organizations and you have uh, authorities on the ground and they might understand their situation better than people outside and if you want to take certain things and try to implement them and you don't fully comprehend the situation on the ground it can end up uh, Cre creating a lot of problems and having negative uh, effects. So the counter narrative to, to extremism and violent extremism. I think one of the major challenges for religions and religious leaders is that um, um, it's a kind of weaknesses within the religious narrative uh, in the framework of, of CVE because in general religious narrative is, um, um, is more a preaching narrative and more, uh, I would say, related to a uh, kind of absolute truth that is being preached to, uh, to the society. Um, wh when we, we worked with youth and religious leaders and we studied the situation, I mean, and why youth are, and especially youth, attracted by extremist narratives, I mean, so we put them together with religious leaders and we tried to initiate this dialogue. And uh, I, I'm still remembering this answer from one of the youth who was, who was saying to the, addressing the religious leaders and telling them, look at a film of ISIS, uh, what they show in their film. First, they show the action. 
And then they finish the film by quoting some verses and saying, this action was according to this teaching. And this young man was saying, telling religious leaders in a very strong way, what you do is always the opposite. You start by the teaching, and then we don't see the action. And this is why we are more attracted by those who are called extremists, ISIS, or things like this. So what we try to develop with them, in fact, we, we came out with, with a concept that we called existential narrative. Because the counter-narrative has its own weaknesses because it's a preaching narrative and it's not yet showing the action. While an existential narrative is always engaging youth, engaging community, and not just those who preach, not just the, the leadership, but engaging youth, community, with their also religious leadership. Leadership. I will um, very briefly um, uh, give you an example. We identified a, um, a two young uh, people in Upper Egypt, in the Said, in a very remote area, uh, in a village where there had been, have been many conflicts between Copts and Muslims. Copts trying to build a church, Muslims build this church, and they, uh, they were victims in this, in this village. We identified two persons, uh, um, uh, one uh, a Coptic man and a, and a Muslim woman. Working together very simply on peace education uh, for the youth of the village, together, Christian and Muslim, in the place of this church or where they are trying to build the church. We simply went there, we filmed them, we, uh, we uh, um, put online two minutes uh, film of their stories. In one week they got more than two million views. And then they were, they, they became a national story. Everybody in Egypt started talking about uh, uh, Samer and Hana. They were received by a TV channel. And then the Ministry of Youth and Education gave them this year the, the award of uh, co coexistence. I mean, the heroes of co for coexistence. And so they became model for so many other now uh, Copts or Muslims in Egypt to do the same. And now, I mean, religious leaders who, with whom we work, they start their preaching by showing the story. By saying, I mean, there are acts. We are able to make difference on the ground. And this, this story is based on the gospel, and that's this teaching, and in the Quran, and this teaching. This is exactly, I would say, the strategy of extremists. Uh, and it's so important for two reasons, and I, I will finish with this. First reason, it's so important because it, it uh, rebuilds the bridges between the grassroots level and the leadership. So, so the, the religious leaders are not just preaching uh, in an abstract way, they are talking about the life of their communities, and the community also is based on the on the on the teaching is trying to live and to show something that they are being lived. Uh, it's being lived. This is the first level of importance, and second level of importance is what I call interreligious social responsibility, uh, which uh, move the narrative from a stigma where we usually, in these societies, we accuse a community uh, to be responsible of, of the extremism or of uh, uh, violence that is happening in society, we move, it, we move the narrative to the responsibility of people of faith, how they can face together uh, the challenges where these challenges are not anymore identified to a community, but to, to their direct source of problems, the people who are causing, the extremists who are causing these problems are not any community that is responsible of these problems. Thank Thank you. Um, we have a whole pile of questions and not much time, so we're going to, I'm going to ask people to try to give a short answer so we can get to a number of these. But here's, here's the first one. Can hate speech or insightful rhetoric be justified under religious freedom? Big question. Let me ask another one. You think about the answer. If it were, no, no, no. We're going to come back to that. But I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. Maybe the sheikh could answer that. A very difficult question. Freedom is always something that uh, an insan, when he feels that he's absolutely free, sometimes he'll go uh, to an extreme or, or go beyond uh, the, the norms of a society. 
so it goes back to really standards and and normative practices in a society so people should understand that they're they're part of a society and we have to educate people we have to have a balanced type of education where people don't use their freedom to uh, to do things that are harmful uh, let me add something to this I I like what uh, Father Fadi said. Uh, you know, to 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 give uh, awards to people that are doing these actions. We, for instance, we gave a award to uh, some priest in Central African Republic because they'd done incredible work helping conviviality between Muslims and Christians. So when you find religious leadership that, that have influence in a society and that, that are balanced and are teaching people in a good way, uh, and we should support their work and make sure that, th that they're honored. Uh, we, can't, we can't control people's thoughts. Uh, and we can't control their actions, but we can help uh, uh, to illuminate their thoughts and to better their actions. Thank you. Well, this might be a related question. Um, many Americans still see violent extremism as an issue specifically within Islam. Has using non-religious terms like countering violent extremism and community resilience been helpful in changing public perception? And what is the role of the media in broadening the definition and understanding of violent extremism beyond any one religion or beyond religion in general? Anyone like to tackle that? You guys are tough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I would like to ask not directly about this question, but in, 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 um, about the previous one, in the fact, and, and it's related to this question also. But um, I mean, in liberal societies, it's it's very normal uh, uh, for people to believe and to say something that is really um, can be uh, a harming uh, uh, morally. I would say harming the others. I mean, and this is a huge uh, issue between the and Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah was saying that we should talk about and defend religious freedom, but also with civil peace and and social peace and, and try to, to, to keep them together. It's not meaning that we have to put a condition for religious freedom. Religious freedom is, is absolute. But uh, when I'm practicing my religious freedom, I should be aware also that uh, and, and religious freedom is about practicing religion. And practicing religion is about being responsible. And first responsibility of a believer is, is to, 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 to preserve peace and harmony within, within society. And this is why I think we... we should definitely, I would always and absolutely defend the right for religious freedom, but at the same time we should do the same efforts also um, within each community uh, and socially also to make people responsible of their acts and their, uh, and their expressions also when it offend uh, the others. And this is a huge problem. I mean, it was, we, we worked on it two years uh, with, with experts from different communities, especially Christian and Muslim, uh, about the issue of takfir. I mean, accusing the other of being a disbeliever. Uh, how how is this accusation, which is based also on religious freedom, I, I can believe whatever I want. I mean, about about the others and their and their beliefs. But how this uh, attitude and this uh, this way of thinking um, is um, can we how we can show that is counterproductive for faith itself, and so how we can make from religious freedom a challenge for theology and to go for a more inclusive theology and more inclusive uh, theological uh, development. I think this is a crucial question. I wanted to go back to this question because the second one, I think it was more related to maybe American context, but definitely um, perceptions are, are, are very powerful. And working on perception is a, is a top priority, either in, in the society here in the United States or everywhere in the world. I mean, media is something that has a huge power, and we are still lacking in using media. I mean, the power of media uh, to to spread the message we want we want to spread it. Just to give you an example, we launched last year Nadian Foundation a platform called Taadudia, which means pluralism. 
um, uh, online platform. Uh, our aim, I mean, the aim I gave, the, the, the target I gave to the team of this, of this platform, that it's to reach one million person from the Arab world in one year. In one year, the result was we reached 23 million person, which was an amazing and very surprising result. And for me, it's, it's a clear answer that especially the young people, because out of these 23 million, 65% are between 18 and 35 years old, which means that the youth in the Arab world are looking for uh, these values of pluralism and, 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 and this, this narrative that, that is based on pluralism and inclusivity, but they are not easy, they cannot easy find these on the online media. And this is why, I mean, it's crucial also to give the place the media deserves in this battle. Thank you. Um, I'm going to add another question, and Oliver and Humara, you can answer whichever of the other two or this one. Uh, advice for practitioners. What have you seen go wrong with approaches uh, on religious engagement by international agencies and NGOs? A any, any of the questions on the table? <laughs> I'll take the second question. <laughs> it's like Jeopardy. That's the, the sort of... Um, and that's around the labels, right? The labels, the language, changing labels, the role of media. So, well, communities are smart, right? Changing the label from countering violent extremism to now calling it community engagement to then calling it community resilience, people get it. <laughs> they understand that they are trying to be duped in that sense, right? So no, has it helped? No. Has it, and part of this is that if the baseline, you do not have a trusted relationship between the governance and the population, right? there's always going to be suspicion. And so the relabels are never going to be sufficient. So there's a place where, again, the state has to have build relationships with society. And Humar, just so we get one more question, yes. it's related to that. How do we motivate those in power to be inclusive? Uh, that's and another tolerance one. That's difference. <laughs> oh, that's that's a whole other one. Um, but but I also want to take this actually back to the to what happens with media, right? And and is it only when we talk about violent extremism, the assumption is it's only about it's related to Al Qaeda, ISIS, etc., right? The black flaggers, the whole spectrum of black flagger movements, and. Yes, media has a role to play with it, but certainly so do our legal systems, and so do policy-making bodies. If you look at the, Uni the United Nations Security Council, right, and the preamble for pretty much every res resolution which comes out, it says, this is not about any one religion, do not discriminate against any religion. And yet, when it defines what it is you're looking at, it restricts it to Al-Qaeda, Daesh, Rif and affiliates. So it actually does not open the space to other types of violent extremist groups, even though they are alive and thriving in so many countries. Right? So it's, it's at that level. In the media space, and I'm going to, let me talk about the US context, because we have a very special context over here. Because if you look at, for example, when Dylan Roof, he shot, like, he killed so many people in the church. Right? He was charged with a hate crime and not with domestic terrorism. And the question is why? Because the media will report what is actually happening in the courts. But why is that? And that's because in our legal system, at the federal level, right, we have a definition of domestic terrorism, but there are no criminal charges associated with it. So they can't, they can't even prosecute him for domestic terrorism because the prosecutors don't have the tools for it. So what you end up with is when the media reports, so if it's a Muslim, it's going to be here is the terrorist charges because it's associated with a foreign terrorist organization and it gets a, a terrorism label. But then if you look at the domestic cases which are happening, the domestic with other groups, the white supremacists, etc., with the tools, like, that just don't even exist. And so the legal system has a huge role to play in how we manage the space. Yes, media has a role. It certainly sensationalizes, but they are not the only stakeholders in the space. Great, thank you. Um, we're, we're out of time, but Oliver, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on some very provocative questions. So globally, uh, the terminology differs from country to country, there are debates within and across countries about is it preventing violent extremism, countering violent extremism. Uh, in many in Western Europe call it counter-radicalization and have done so for years. Uh, but the interesting thing is that as soon as you stop talking about terminology and you start talking about the nature and the substance of the response, people are pretty much on the same page. You talk about what makes for an effective counter-narrative or doesn't. 
uh, what makes for good community engagement or what doesn't. Uh, then people are on the same page and the conversation uh, flows uh, because you're talking about responses and uh, people can agree. Uh, and it, in some cases, it's almost intuitive that multiple actors in a community, not just religious leaders, but educators and social workers and youth themselves, all have to be involved in this effort. And it's very hard to disagree with, uh, with sort of uh, almost intuitive uh, approaches like that if you're gonna do this work effectively. Um, on the media, I think that um, there have been a lot of media training programs uh, around the world that have been going on for decades and journalists are taught skills like investigative reporting and this sort of thing and to the extent that that can be applied to understanding terrorism, radicalization, recruitment, what drives it, what doesn't and being able to help inform media or journalists by getting them together with researchers locally who know this topic, I think that that would be very helpful. Great, thanks Oliver. Uh, Sheikh bin Bai, I want to give you the last word. If you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us on um, maybe words of, of encouragement uh, on how to best move forward with this challenge. In the name of God. Uh, these dialogues are very important, but maybe even more important is we, we, we basically create small groups so we can look for put, putting new approaches and, and, and new solutions to these problems. We can talk around the same issues and, and we can talk to a lot of different groups, but very often we don't see the fruits of these things. You have tens of uh, institutes. Uh, if they visited, uh, for instance, Abu Dhabi, if they visited us there, or our center in, in uh, Morocco, they, they have questions and they visit at different places, then it would be possible for them to kind of get a sound understanding on the ground of what's happening. Each of us know uh, what's happening in our areas, especially things surrounding uh, freedom and trying to prevent extremism. But have we arrived together, all of us? Um, we, 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 some of us have arrived and understand these problems. We have a group in Morocco that's working on concept. We have 50 students that are just uh, dealing with the concepts uh, of these issues. So for instance, the concepts surrounding extreme, extremism. And also to, to do a type of uh, renewal of just religious discourse, to, to create a, a, a new uh, religious discourse that we can reach large numbers. For instance, in the Forum for Promoting Peace, uh, we're, we're now we've started an encyclopedia of peace, uh, and we have a, a journal called Peace. So we have also coexistence. Um, we're trying to promote these these values. If we want to really strengthen these uh, and to really form a, a leadership that can promote these, and then they we can treat uh, we can we can basically train the trainers so that they can go out and then have a much broader influence. Uh, this Alliance of Virtue, for instance, we have some of the leadership here, Bob Roberts and others. Imam Majid didn't come today, but uh, he's also involved in that. Yeah. Yeah, he's preoccupied. So this, this could, could really do a lot of good because we're trying to give examples for people. 
uh, we need a, a, a religious leadership that says we're, 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 we're friends, we're together, we're, we're all on the same planet, we're all living in the same planet. You, there's, now we're living in a time you can't choose who you're living next to. Uh, we're, we're in a new world and, and, and so we should uh, be sharing it together. I want to give a quick thank you also to the wonderful USIP Peace and Religion team, Susie, Pawasha, Melissa, thank you. Um, and uh, once again, we invite everyone to join us in the Leland Terrace, which is just up the stairs. Um, have some refreshments, learn more about the work of USIP, IRI, and Search for Common Ground, and we will begin our next panel on interfaith peace building and religious freedom back here at 1.15. Um, and for those who would like to participate in Friday prayers, we have space downstairs in the Peace Link room and our team will guide you to that space. Thank you everybody and see you soon. مثل الكاردينال جون والسناتور رون فأنا أشكرهم جميعا ويسمحوا لي أنا كبير في سن نسيت Hello, everyone. Um, uh, just a final message. Uh, the Sheikh said he really wanted to uh, express a, a special greetings to uh, um, Congressman uh, Frank Wolf uh, for his remarks, as well as the presence of uh, Cardinal John uh, Onaiken from Nigeria. Uh, please give him and uh, the congressman a round of applause, please. Thank you so much.